Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton is a musical counterweight to our country's current debate on immigration. Its lyrics ask, will they know what you overcame, and declare, the world will never be the same. With nearly one in four children in this country, either an immigrant or the child of an immigrant, it's important we as pediatricians understand what these children have overcome and the impact recently introduced U.S. policies will have on their health and well-being. Our next speaker, Dr. Julie, Lin Dr. Julie Linton, is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Wake Forest School of Medicine and co-chair of the AAP Immigrant Health Special Interest Group. Dr. Linton will explain how current federal policy affects clinical care and outline what pediatricians can do to support children in immigrant families. Let's welcome Dr. Julie Linton. After the inspiring words of Dr. Stein and Dr. Towns Miranda, I couldn't be more humbled or honored to deliver this message. Today, I have the overwhelming task of trying to describe the changing policy landscape for children and immigrant families, to illustrate the impact of evolving policy on children and families, and to offer opportunities for pediatricians to support and advocate for children in immigrant families. In effort to do this, I will discuss the stories of children and families for whom I provide care in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, but I have changed some of the names and identifying details to protect their confidentiality and in today's world to protect their safety. One in four U.S. children lives in an immigrant family. The map here displays the darker colors for higher percentages of children in immigrant families, meaning that that child, or at least one parent, was born outside of the United States. You notice there are no white states. All of us will have the opportunity and the good fortune to care for children and immigrant families. I'd like to remind everyone that nine out of 10 of these children, despite what you're being led to believe, are US citizens. So I'd like to be frank this morning and to remind everybody that in the world of policy for children and immigrant families, things have simply gone from bad to worse. As a pediatrician, I firmly believe that immigration should be a nonpartisan issue. And as a pediatrician, in the words of Dr. Bernard Dreyer, I am nonpartisan, but I am unabashedly pro-child and pro-family. I will go through some of the recent policies and then I'll, in brief detail, and then I'll go through with more detail using the stories of some of the children for whom I care. In January of 2017, there were executive orders on border security, on interior enforcement, there was a travel ban and a halt on refugee resettlement, and there was a leaked executive order on public charge. In February through March of 2017, we saw the travel ban halted, a revised ban placed, and then another ban. We saw the threat of family separation at the border by Secretary Kelly, and the AAP released a policy on the detention of immigrant children. In June of 2017, the surge initiative threatened to target the parents of unaccompanied children as criminals for helping their children to flee violence and seek safety. And 
the travel ban was restored, and 10 attorneys general demanded that DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, ended. In August through September of 2017, we saw that Hurricane Harvey wreaked havoc across Texas. But I'd like everybody to, rem everybody to remember that those without resources, although people came together, may have suffered more. 50 families were left by Immigration and Customs Enforcement at a bus stop during the hurricane when the buses were not running. A DACA recipient lost his life protecting the lives of others during the hurricane. An orderly wind down of DACA was ordered and massive raids targeting thousands in the interior of the United States may be coming over the next couple of weeks in something called Operation Mega. I have never been more grateful to be a pediatrician. Despite the threats on children, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out to be first, be right, and be credible. Thank you to Dr. Remley for that powerful and inspiring phrase. Time and time again, we have stood up to protect immigrant children, to state against the revised immigrant and refugee travel ban, to oppose the separation of mothers and children at the border, and to most recently oppose President Trump's decision to end DACA. We, as pediatricians, first and foremost, care for all children, regardless of where they or their parents were born. And we continue to put that as our top priority. I will discuss some of the cases to bring home the messages. I do regret that this may be upsetting, but I think it's incredibly important for us to acknowledge the reality of what the families that we face are facing and the privilege we have to be part of their lives and the support that they need. It is not illegal to come and seek protection at our border. Despite what you hear in the media and from the current rhetoric, it is not illegal to come to our border and seek protection. Manuela is a 15-year-old girl. She was born in Mexico. She witnessed the, mother of, the murder of her mother by a gang and was subsequently shot by the same gang, suffering severe injuries for which she received limited treatment in Mexico before fleeing to the United States. She was in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement while they sought to find a placement for her that could meet her medical needs. Rather than being welcomed as somebody seeking safety from violence, she was met with executive orders that called for a wall and an increase in border patrol and detention on the southern border. When children are first detained, they're sent to CBP processing centers where conditions threaten children's health and well-being. This is an image taken from the border trip that I was grateful to be able to participate in with the American Academy of Pediatrics to bear witness to the conditions to which children are exposed. There we saw fencing that extended from the floor to the ceiling. We saw lights that were on 24 seven. And we heard children describe that they were being fed sandwiches that were kept so cold to avoid mold that they were often frozen. This is not how we welcome children seeking safety. Children undergo a complex process upon immigrating to the United States. And I'd refer you to the policy statement released on detention of immigrant children for the gory details. But I'd like to make a point to all of us in the community who are seeing these children and families regarding policy implications. Regarding access to health care, only Massachusetts, California, Illinois, New York, Washington State, and the District of Columbia provide Medicaid services to eligible children regardless of their immigration status. Everywhere else, 
we are forced to come up with creative opportunities to seek care for children, whether it's in federally qualified health centers, in public health departments, in free clinics, or through charity care. But many of the children are not accessing care at all in those locations. Regarding free public education, the 1982 decision by Plyler v. Stowe guaranteed the right to school for all children, regardless of immigration status. However, there are municipalities across the country that have sought to limit that access to their entitled public education. Regarding access to legal representation, more than half of children in flight would be eligible for some type of legal relief if only they had the opportunity to defend their cases. Legal representation improves outcomes in court, and improved outcomes in court confer access to public benefits, including health care for children. We as pediatricians, through trauma-informed history taking and supportive documentation, can in turn support better legal outcomes. Let's talk about refugee families. The Ali family fled Syria three years ago. They were forced to reside in Jordan with their, three, their four children, three of whom have complex chronic conditions, during which time they had a complete gap in their education and were unable to attend school. Upon getting to the United States, they were met with fear and uncertainty in the setting of a ban that temporarily halted all entry from six Muslim-majority countries and all refugee resettlement, and ultimately sought to cut refugee resettlement in half. There are 2,500,000 Syrian refugees, and half are children. The Malangu family has two parents and five children. The two parents fled the Democratic Republic of the Congo 20 years ago in the setting of armed conflict. There they remained in the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya for 19 years, where all five of their children were born. Upon moving to the United States, their cousins, who were also entitled to come, had to wait. Although they had already secured refugee status, their visa exams expired in the setting of the temporary ban, and they got to the back of the line. All states except Wyoming have a refugee resettlement program, and all of us in our clinical practice will engage with and care for refugees. These executive orders make it extraordinarily difficult for families who have suffered so much and have left so much behind to feel welcome in the country they now call home. Eduardo is a nine-year-old boy I take care of. He presented to clinic complaining of headaches and difficulty concentrating in school. Upon further questioning, he shared with me that his parents are undocumented, and every time he went to school, he feared that by the time he got home, his parents wouldn't be there. The executive order, interior enforcement, changing enforcement priorities to all people, regardless of their criminal activity, to only the emphasizing legal status, and punishing sanctuary cities threatens the health and well-being of children. There have been further rumors that there may be an executive order regarding public charge. A leaked order was released in January. This would deny admission or adjustment of status to those likely to become a public charge or dependent on the government for subsidies. Not just cash benefits are included in the leaked order, but all public benefits, including Medicaid, food stamps, and WIC. A public charge order would alienate children from accessing services to which they are entitled. And in my mind, threatens the fundamental role of pediatricians in addressing the social determinants of health and promoting health equity. Almost 6 million U.S. citizen children under the age of 18 live in mixed-status families. We are not 
talking about a small number of children impacted by the policies that we are currently facing. Finally, DACA. Patricia is a 14-year-old girl who I saw last week in clinic. She's a straight-A student. Her parents are so proud of what she has done to counter the sacrifices that they've made to build a future for her. She was in tears telling me her dreams were in limbo. DACA has protected nearly 800,000 children and young adults, with another nearly 228,000 children under 15 years, like Patricia, who would have aged into eligibility. I'd also like to point out that we need to avoid criminalizing parents of DACA participants and DACA eligible youth for the dream of a hopeful future for their children. As a mother and a pediatrician, I never want to have to make a choice between safety and hope for my children and crossing a border. I can't imagine what that's like, and I can only imagine that as every parent that we take care of, I want the best for my kids. Immigration enforcement policies are currently threatening family separation. And as we heard from Dr. Towns Miranda, there is nothing more sacred than the attachment between parents and their children. Actual parental deportation is associated with mental health problems and family economic instability. And fear and uncertainty regarding deportation are associated with a negative psychological impact, limited perceived access to care, and limited enrichment experiences. We have extensive data that shows that DACA is beneficial to children who receive it, as well as to their families, with regards to economic opportunities as well as mental health benefits. Comprehensive immigration reform is the untapped possibility for protecting family unit. We need comp comprehensive immigration reform that keeps families together and that invests in children and families who dream of contributing to our collective prosperity. So in the setting of a marathon that is uphill with a moving finish line, what can we as pediatricians do to support and protect immigrant families? First and foremost, we can welcome immigrant families with compassion. We can create safe spaces for them. This is an image from the signage in Bellevue Hospital. We care about your health, not your immigration status. And although each of us in our own institutions will need to reconcile how we share this message in a way that is acceptable at all levels, we can begin by welcoming families and providing care that is compassionate and of the highest quality. The AAP Immigrant Health Toolkit has a wealth of resources to provide information about how to provide care for children and immigrant families. And I'd encourage you to seek out that resource if you have not yet. Healthcare providers, legal colleagues, and communities can support families to prepare for threatened separation. There's a number of ways that this can be done. It may be in the form of providing materials, to children and families who seek care in your clinic, and KIND, or Kids in Need of Defense, has put together a wealth of resources in partnership with other legal organizations for families to prepare with documentation in the event of separation. The National Immigration Law Center has also developed a toolkit, which is based with a login, so you have to register to access it, for providers to know our rights in the event that we're faced with an immigration raid or enforcement activities that occur within the healthcare setting. Each of us has a role to build resilience among these families. Children and family are threatened with fear and uncertainty that is well beyond our individual control. But we can empower children and families in strategies to mitigate stress and build resilience. We can read to children 
we can talk to children, we can sing with children, and we can play together. This is not just for the children and immigrant families, but this is for all of us. And every single one of us has a role to empower all children, including our own, to speak up against hate. As I mentioned earlier, I've never been prouder to be a pediatrician, and there's a number of opportunities for us to put kids first. If this is of particular interest to you, I'd encourage you to consider joining the AAP Immigrant Health Special Interest Group. But at a broader level, you can connect via social media as a tweetiatrician, and you can become a key contact via the AAP Department of Federal Affairs to respond to action alerts when the health and well-being of children are threatened by policy. Immigration policies increasingly threaten the health and well-being of immigrant families, and pediatricians are uniquely poised to provide credible, caring messages to support immigrant families from the bedside to the community to the broader public sphere. It takes a village to do this work, and I'm grateful for so many of the people in the room and our colleagues and partners in cross-sector organizations for joining together to stand up, resist fear and uncertainty, and support children and families. There are some references available, and I believe those two slides have been excluded from this, but there is a beautiful picture of Dr. Fernando Stein and Dr. Bernard Dreyer at the border holding and providing compassion to recently arrived immigrant families at the Sacred Heart Shelter. Thank you to the American Academy of Pediatrics for standing up to be first, be right, and be credible in the care of children and immigrant families.